I realize. All right. So let's, uh, hey everybody, how are you, how you doing? I'm Implant Mike over here. I'm Dr. Calderon, Mike Calderon from New York. And I'm actually doing this live from Chicago O'Hare Airport. I have the privilege of introducing a good friend of mine, all right? Dr. Paresh here. And what was great about it, what's great about Dr. Paresh, we knew each other on social media. We still know each other on social media, but I had the privilege of being with his daughter uh, at Rutgers Perio. And, you know, a beautiful woman, beautiful person like, uh, like her father. And me being a father of five daughters, I know what he's going through. But Dr. Press is going to show his expertise. He's from Canada, and he graduated back in 1991, which makes him about almost my age. I'm not going to say younger or older. <laughs> okay. But uh, everyone, this is going to be a great moment. He's going to show you, I, I believe it's two cases, right, Doc? Yeah, correct. Yes. Okay. So we're going to be showing two cases and, and Dr. Press is great because he likes to incorporate all different disciplines in it, not just one thing. So you guys are going to get a load of information here, a load of information here. And what's going to happen is when you do this and get this load of information, you're going to be able to get it from all different aspects of your practice. So Dr. Press, I'm sure you're going to do a great job with this. I'm looking forward to this, but I want to tell you in advance, if I get disconnected because I'm stuck in Chicago, O'Hare Airport, no. um, Forgive me, yeah. but go for it. Let's do this, right, gotcha. Dr. Presh. Show, right. show us what you're made of. All right. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that very much. I'm going to mute you guys um, just in case. I'm going to mute you just in case of the airport, but if you need to hear me, just uh, let me know, okay? Okay. All right. Signal me if you have and to. And let's go. Are we okay here? All right. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, for... Uh, for taking the time to spend the next uh, 45 minutes with me. Um, my topic is the importance of integrated treatment planning. It's something I've been practicing for 30 years and it's something that is near and dear to me. It's uh, focusing on, com on a comprehensive approach to dentistry as opposed to just focusing on single teeth. I know it sounds very simple and I'm sure everyone looks at it and go, well, I do that, but you know, I'm gonna walk you through two cases and uh, just some of the thought process that I've had with my specialists and uh, maybe some of the things that you might want to look at slightly differently uh, as time goes on or when the next time you see a case. First of all, I want to thank the top 100 docs and it's been, um, it's been a, a privilege to be part of this group and to be uh, recognized this way. Um, I know there's lots of people out there that could be exactly the same and um, and uh, I'm honored. I have no financial disclosures for this presentation either. I'm not receiving any financial compensation or honorarium. Um, as Mike said, uh, I'm from Winnipeg, Canada. I've been practicing for 30 years. I actually just built a brand new office, a brand new clinic, Mike. So I've actually taken on more debt again, <laughs> but I'm enjoying, I love what I do. Um, I, I have a a history of, of uh, lots of education. Uh, I don't know, perennial student, but uh, did a master's in physiology as well before dentistry. And I run a Seattle study club, which is an interdisciplinary study club in, Winni in Winnipeg as well with my close friend, uh, who's an orthodontist. My daughter is in Perio at Rutgers. She's almost finished. She was in with Mike. So the two of them know one, each other, one another very well. And she lives in the New York area. Mike, I don't think she's coming back. So I think she wants to live there. So you might have to look after her and take on a sixth daughter now. Don't um, worry. That'll be my pleasure. My wife, that'll be my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. And then my, uh, my wife's in corporate finance and uh, she has her own business. So I get to learn a little bit from her as well. All right. Let's get to the presentation. Um, my goals are twofold. One is learning some simple criteria to distinguish between a routine restorative case and an interdisciplinary case. And there are some criteria that I'll present. And, and if you're not looking at it that way, I would implore you to consider looking at things differently on Monday morning when you actually see your next patient, whether it's in hygiene or, or in your dental chair. And then learn how to leverage your interdisciplinary team to optimize outcomes. I know there's lots of people that are super dentists. Uh, I used to be one myself where I would just want to do everything, but I, I found as, as the years go on, uh, focusing on the things that work really well for me in my hands and some of the things that I can lean on expertise with people. For example, Mike, who has tremendous amount of experience in implants and grafting, why not have someone like him do some of that treatment where I can do the restorative part really, really well. 
Uh, so let's go through the two cases and I hope you I can highlight some of the different things that were going on and Mike may chime in here and there. Otherwise at the end, he'll probably ask a couple of questions. But this is uh, a patient who's a 48 year old male. Now, I'm gonna present you some of the records. So I'll get you to look at what I'm looking at or what we're looking at as a team. So you can in your mind, um, you know, start thinking about how you, what your problem list is and how you might treat it. I'm not expecting you to agree with everything that in terms of the way that we've treated it, you might treat it differently, but maybe it'll show you a different perspective. He wasn't satisfied with the smile. He's concerned about his bite, which he referred to that way. And he did snore when we first met him as a patient. Uh, in fact, it affected his lifestyle and his family as well. So these are his, this is his full face. He had a very difficult time trying to smile. He always said, you know what, I just never, I didn't know how to smile. I didn't like my smile. I just never knew uh, how to do it. So I had to force this smile from him. This is his retracted and unretracted smile. And then when you look at um, both sides, obviously there's some crowding. Um, He's got an occlusal plane discrepancy. Um, treating this in a restorative manner can be very challenging. This is what it looks like from both occlusal uh, views of his arches as well. And now if you look even closer, he has a fair amount of erosion. And that erosion came from years of gastric reflux. And so what was happening is he was get, creating some sensitivity and he was wearing the teeth out. We were treating it originally, I was treating it originally with just placing some composites in that area because that's all he was really comfortable doing at that time. And as you can imagine over the years, it really wasn't gonna last very long because of certain uh, occlusal situations. So when we look at the dental findings right now, he's got worn and misshaped teeth, he has crowding, and he basically, he did have sensitivity to cold. When we look at his uh, function. And I like to look at everything from function, like your, your joint, your function, aesthetics, perio, and, uh, and your, your, uh, as I said, your, your TMJ as well, all of those things. So he didn't have any problems with function. He had no functional deficits, no joint noises, no pain. His medical history, he did snore. He did. Um, later, we did get a sleep study and he actually suffers from some sleep apnea. Plus he has uh, gastro, uh, gastric reflux as well. From a periodontal point of view, really uh, impeccable. He didn't really have any major issues. He's uh, AAP uh, um, stage two, grade A. And uh, he's been stable and he attends his uh, periodontal visits or his periodontal maintenance visits on a regular basis, at least twice a year. Uh, so this, for those that wanna see, um, this is his perio chart. From a radiographic point of view, I'm just right now showing um, showing his panoramic, but nice bone, nice teeth, really good roots. So what are our challenges? Well, the challenges, first of all, is aesthetics. That was something that was concerning him. Um, definitely sleep apnea and his erosion, his, uh, his GERD. He has worn teeth, he has crowding. And one of the key things is a limited prosthetic space. And what that is, is that he didn't really have room to restore his teeth to natural function within his occlusion. And so that was a challenge. And how did I know that? Well, first of all, when you look at his occlusion, he's an MIP, he's contacting everywhere. And number two, when I was just trying to restore some of the palatal of his, or the incisal, or the lingual of his uh, upper anteriors, they weren't lasting very long. As soon as we were biting in that area, the challenge was uh, that those were the only teeth he was chewing at. So some simple principles that I use to solve similar cases. When we're treating dental aesthetics, um, and this is a reference from Spear, Coke, Kitchen, Matthews, but when you look at tooth position and you look at gingival heights and you look at the arrangement of the teeth within the arch, if all of those are acceptable, really it's a straightforward restorative case, we only have to focus on color and tooth shape. And we can do it with what most of us restorative docs do well, is restorative dentistry. So for example, a case like this, where a person just has some discolored teeth, but the arrangement of the teeth, gingival heights are all right, everything's good. Well, you can do it in direct, you can do it in indirect, but it's a restorative case. It's, it's simpler to use, to do. Now, with when any combination of tooth position, 
gingival heights or the arrangement of the teeth are not acceptable, the treatment is more complex and we should be considering an interdisciplinary approach. Now, I'm not here to pass judgment whether you want to do all of those interdisciplinary um, treatments. That's fine. But we should be considering more than just restorative. Okay. So in my case, I end up involving either a periodontist, an orthodontist, an oral surgeon, something like that. So uh, for example, let me just show you that. I'm just, my, my apology, I just moved a little too fast. In a case like this, you know, where the arrangement of the teeth within the arch aren't appropriate. Well, what do we need to do there? The tissue heights or the gingival heights are not appropriate. We need to do something. The tooth positions aren't in the right spot. So this is interdisciplinary. How do you deal with it? Do we involve ortho? Do we involve perio? Do we involve surgery and have an implant or implants placed in there? Do we do restorative and bridge work? It does involve multiple uh, disciplines. So we should at least discuss the other disciplines that we might involve or that the patient might benefit from rather than just doing it in a restorative manner. Restorative changes Paris. to length. Are we doing? Paris, yes. Paris, may I ask you a question here? Maybe some people are yeah. curious. So you're including a bunch of dis disciplines here. Okay. A bunch of disciplines here. And what's going to happen is, are you taking care of, because I know that I believe your daughter is going to be a periodontist. So will she be helping Correct. out with this? You're getting opinion. Are you referring to other people? Because uh, here in the United States, I mean, a lot of dentists, you know, over the years, unfortunately, as we get older, uh, we have yeah. a lot of experience, get a lot of training. We have a lot of perio, right. a lot of ortho underneath us. But you there right. in Canada, how does it work there? Are you able to do it? No, it's the same. Honestly, it's the same. I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I used to be a super dentist and I thought I could do everything. What I found is that there were certain things I did well, but not great. And so I've started to involve, uh, I've started to work more with my specialists. But that's why I said I'm, I'm not passing judgment. If you are very capable of doing some of these things, do it. That's fine. What I'm trying to get at is, don't just use the hammer and the nail. That's all you have in your toolbox. Just go, okay, restorative, restorative, restorative. If the patient can benefit from a periodontal procedure, whether it's grafting, connective tissue graft, osseous crown lengthening, well, why not do that? If they can benefit from orthodontics to get the right alignment, let's get that, let's talk about that discipline and involve that in there. Does, does that make sense? Definitely. What I wanted to make sure that you got the information across was um, they need to be capable of doing everything proficiently, doing it well is something that can be reproducible um, just because Correct. they heard of it or they, they did a little course, they shouldn't try and do everything. Um, that takes 100%. a lot of experience. You know what? And, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's kind of what I was earlier in my career in the mid-career where I was just doing, I was trying everything. I've taken courses, learned from people, but you start realizing as you see your follow-ups some of the stuff is not as stable, is not as predictable because you're not doing it as much. And so that's where I chose to uh, start going, okay, look, uh, let me find a couple of great periodontists. Let me find a couple of great surgeons and orthodontists and, and let's work collaboratively together. And so that's where it's helped. My message today is, uh, I, I'm glad you brought that up, is if you're not gonna be able to do it to the standard that we should, then find the specialist to do that. But don't don't avoid talking about that particular procedure or that discipline because you're not comfortable with it, right? Uh, if the person can benefit from some orthodontics, at least mention it to them. Hey, if we do orthodontics, um, whether it's with Invisalign or brackets, I can achieve a more predictable result. I can be more conservative on my treatment. And if they say no, that's fine. But you, you we owe it to yeah. them to explain that. You're right. absolutely right. Yes. And that's that's what I want to make sure everybody's getting the, the big pictures. Like know your limitations. If you know the water's too deep, know your you're not comfortable. Because yeah, because right. everybody can do anything, but you have to know your limitations. Perfect. Perfect. Right. Thank you so and much for us. Don't and, and don't avoid talking about it because you're not comfortable with that or you're not comfortable referring it for a consultation at least. Let the patient get the informed consent. And if you don't understand how how it can be done, then 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 work with people who can help you with that and teach you that. That's all. I mean, when we're looking at things and we're we're, we're evaluating, we want to evaluate everything from the face out, 
you know, macro aesthetics, what David Sarver said here in his article is you look at the whole face, you see how everything is, and then you start working within everything that's framed within the lips. And then you pull the lips back and you look at all the details. We need to look at all of those things when we're planning a case. And it's hard to do all that when we're just focusing on restorative only, but everything's restoratively driven. But we, with, when we look at everything from the face in, we start seeing, recognizing the benefits of other disciplines to make that final result as optimal as possible, assuming the patient wants that. And, and so these are some uh, references that I can always send out afterwards. If anyone wants to see, you can just reach out to me. But I mentioned about four foundations, aesthetics, function, biomechanics, which is the structure and how heavily restored teeth are, and periodontal. If we look at all of those together, we can come up with a and formulate a treatment plan that's going to be more comprehensive. We've got to start moving away from looking at teeth as single teeth. And we've got to start looking at moving away, at moving towards a comprehensive approach. When we look at single teeth, we create dentistry as a commodity. And all we're doing is, yeah, are all crowns, like if you look at that, the composite down in the, in the middle of the screen, I mean, it's got multiple shades. Is that, are all composites the same? No, they're not. Sometimes we spend so much extra time doing it, it's a lot different from somewhere else, uh, from the next person. And so we need to start explaining to the patients the value of what we do and our expertise and our experience and, and our knowledge as well. Orthodontics has been a, a huge um, addition to the practice. I, I only do a little bit of it because I've got an amazing orthodontist that I work with. And, and so, you know, not only is he my best friend, but he's the orthodontics has been one of my best friends in my practice, because as I start putting teeth in the right spot, it allows me to actually stage treatment over a period of time, because we're now not, we've managed the occlusion, we've got everything in the right spot. And so for example, I've you know, this is a, a patient where I actually treated her, it was, we treated her over like a 10 year period, all sorts of treatment, ortho, implants, restorative, perio, uh, peri, all of those things. And there's nothing wrong with doing it over a period of time, if you end up with a nice stable result, and a happy patient. And so the interdisciplinary approach still allowed me to do tons of dentistry, but it was just done over a period of time. From a financial point of view, it's an annuity. It's not all in one shot. It's done over a period of time. Perfectly fine. So let's look at the treatment that was rendered on this patient. Well, some of the challenges, as I said, were aesthetics, snoring, GERD, worn teeth, prosthetic space. And so are we going to, if we're going to just do it restoratively, how are we going to do it with no ortho? We've got the crowding there. Are we going to extract a tooth? Are we not extracting a tooth on the bottom? Are we dealing, how are we dealing with the gingival heights? Are we going to do some, does, is, the, is it important to the patient to have the gingival heights proportional or not? Like how many times have you gone and you haven't discussed anything with the orthodontist and both of you are not on the same page and all of a sudden the teeth are straight, but the gum line's all over the place and the person has a gummy smile and they're going, well, why are my teeth all out of uh, alignment? Well, now we got to start talking about crown lengthening or grafting. That adds a cost, adds a procedure. We might have been able to solve that problem before we even started. Uh, so when we're looking at the criteria, tooth position, gingival heights, arrangement of the teeth, all of those are not ideal. And because they're not ideal, we should be considering an interdisciplinary approach. And as Mike said, whether we're doing all of those disciplines or not, we owe it to the patient to at least discuss that. So for example, this particular one, no prosthetic space, very limited. The occlusion's good, everything's stable. So to have an accurate starting point to every problem, we've got to look at the final visualized endpoint. As long as we have that visualized endpoint, we can work backwards and try and figure out all the pieces to get to where we want to go. So one of the things that uh, I would do, and a lot of people have done that over the years, I've done it as well, is we'll do a diagnostic wax up. In this case, I'd do it digitally because that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years. But um, in the past, I would have mounted models, take some photographs, send the photographs to the lab and have it done in wax on plaster models. But here, having it done digitally. Once it's digitally simulated by the lab, I actually do a mock-up in the patient's mouth. And now the patient will have an opportunity to see what 
um, what it might look like. This is a mock-up that's on the patient's mouth. And he's actually seeing what we potentially can do for him. And it actually made a difference because he's like, wow, this is what I want. I would love to have that. Now I can share that with the patient to, uh, I mean, with the orthodontist and say, listen, he's open to having this, but can we try and achieve this goal? And we actually sit and discuss that together. If I'm doing it my, with Invisalign right now, you can actually do some of that with a digital smile design approach and plan your aligners that way as well. With the snoring, we suspected a sleep apnea. So we ended up having a, a sleep physician diagnose it. And the gas, the reflux was taken um, under control uh, management by a physician. So as we, and, and here's the uh, interpretation of the doctor uh, for the sleep uh, study was uh, moderate sleep apnea, recommended uh, CPAP or dental appliance. However, he also had a neural surgery consult and so with that, the benefit of going through orthodontics and orthognathic surgery was also going to help the sleep apnea. So we actually chose to take that approach because it was going to help his overall wellness as well. Plus, it was going to provide us with the opportunity to improve his restorative situation. So we actually chose the orthognathic surgery and the orthodontic approach. So what we ended up doing is in conjunction with the orthodontist, we ended up discussing treatment in terms of what we wanted to do for restorative. I wanted to, um, I wanted to be able to restore his teeth with minimal preparations. He didn't have a lot of room on the lingual of his upper incisors. We were already wearing through the dentum. He had enamel around the periphery and he had lots of enamel on the, on the facial. So the benefit of creating some prosthetic space by creating some overjet allows me not to have to prep the palatal of those teeth. If the orthodontist can open up the bite and the, the interocclusal relationship better. So here's a pre and post CEPHs for those of you that uh, are surgeons and orthodontists. And what we ended up doing as we were finishing the treatment we wanted to create some opening and some overbite and overjet. And if you look at the center slide, now I've got prosthetic space. And we actually, I was able to sit and discuss this with the orthodontist and say, listen, I'm gonna be doing um, a restoration where I don't wanna prepare the, the lingual of those teeth. I wanna have at least a millimeter of room to be able to place my material in that area in my porcelain, will that, you know, can we do that? And so he actually created the right proportions for me. So I wouldn't have to um, do extensive treatment uh, or tooth removal on that side because he already lost a lot of tooth. Now what he ended up doing is before we removed the brackets, he actually removed them virtually, sent me the STL files. I then sent it to the lab and we started planning the case uh, restoratively uh, by doing another digital design. And once we had that, I had preparation guides. So now the brackets are removed, the ortho is removed, patient comes in to see me. And this is based on his diagnostic wax up. This is a preparation guide. Now, when you look at it, I don't have to prepare the lingual of those upper teeth because the orthodontist has provided me room there. I just have to kind of fine tune uh, a little chamfer in that area. and. I prepared a little bit of the facial to be able to provide some crowns and veneers in these areas. Actually, most of them were actually porcelain veneers. Uh, he left space it for me so that I can improve the proportions. So I didn't prep through those interproximals. And then I took a final scan, sent it to the lab and the lab can start designing our restorations, chose to have uh, lithium disilicate restorations with a cutback and some aesthetic layering. And so you can do that uh, digitally as well. And this is what we ended up with. This is, these are his final restorations, nice level occlusion. Uh, didn't have to prepare the, the lingual of those upper anteriors because they're already were naturally eroded away. And these are the final restorations. But we included orthodontics in the mix. He did have a periodontal consult, but the orthodontist was able to get the gingival heights 
in the right spot so that we didn't have to do anything there. So tooth position, gingival heights, the arrangement of the teeth, are they acceptable or not acceptable? Um, in his case, they weren't acceptable. We took an interdisciplinary approach and orthodontics allowed us to be able to uh, do the treatment restorative like in, in a conservative manner, as conservative a manner as possible and accomplished also correcting all the gingival heights that we needed, that we had an issue of. So that's the first case. And I've got another case that I want to walk through. Similar Hold criteria. Bruce, Bruce, I got a question. Hold on. Yeah. I hope yeah. I didn't miss out on it. Okay. So did, uh, did we, um, when you, when you presented this case to him, okay, obviously a big question that everybody always has is finances. So, but we don't want to talk about how much money we just want to know, uh, the presentation of the whole case to him. Um, and how long was the case going to take? Cause you know, that's a big factor with all patients, as we all know, all over the world. Absolutely. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Okay. So People if you could just give now. us a quick, no money detail okay. thing, but yeah. <laughs> and how long did it take? So, so, so the case took probably about, uh, um, it took about three years. And the reason it took that long is in Canada, in some of, in our city, um, getting the orthognathic surgery done takes time because it goes through our hospital system. Uh, and so there was a delay with that. That was the problem. It could have been completed in about just over two years, but it took three years. Um, having said that, the orthognathic surgery, the majority of it gets covered, which was a benefit to him. In terms of, uh, you know, being speedy and, oh, you want instant stuff. Here's one of the things that I tell patients. If I, when I showed him that mock-up in his mouth and he says, yeah, this is what I want. And then you start seeing all the teeth in a wonky position on the bottom and you don't have any room on the top. I start explaining to them, okay, if I do this restoratively, I've got to pull this tooth down to make these teeth straight so that you can have a bite that's going to be healthy and allow your teeth, your restorations to last. I have to cut down all this healthy enamel on these teeth. And I have to do the same thing on the top. And now you risk root canals. So all of a sudden, it's the treatment is very aggressive. And a lot of times patients will go, geez, I don't want you to cut all these teeth down. And I go, okay, but if we put the teeth in the right spot and you go through orthodontics, but it's going to take you some time, I can do more conservative dentistry. So that's kind of how I present it. There are times people just want the teeth cut down and they're willing to accept it. But that's how I approach it, Mike. So. Okay, good. I'm. Thank you for clearing that up. I wanted to make sure. I'm sure the world is yeah. wants to know what's going on. All righty. All right. So let's go. Case two, man. You're All doing right. great, Bryce. Thank you. All right. Thanks. So this is a 28 year old female. wasn't satisfied with her smile. Doesn't like her crowns, and she's got a gummy smile. She also says, "Hey, my my art, my jaw is V-shaped." She actually brought that up, and she just said, "Look, I want veneers." And you know, lots of people did. They want veneers. And the, they don't really know what veneers are all about. They just hear about it. They see it on Facebook and social media and other people. And so this is what she looks like. She's got a hypermobile lip. She's got a gummy smile. She had those um, crowns done overseas and they were splinted together. Huge overbite and an overjet. Sorry, huge overjet. And when you look at it from the occlusal, very bulky contoured restorations. She had some root canals done as well on those teeth. They weren't bothering her. She didn't like the aesthetics. And that was a key concern. Her jaw, everything looks great. Her contours, everything, I mean, her, her facial features. Um, yes, they are V-shaped, but still um, attractive lady. Uh, dental findings. We have poorly contoured crowns. We've got crowding and narrow arches. Uh, uneven occlusal planes. There's also some graying of the gingiva on teeth number eight and nine. And, you know, she, she also was aware of that. As we start talking to her and asking more questions, she started bringing up more and more concerns. Now, from a TMJ point of view and a function, no functional deficits, no pain, no, um, no joint pain, uh, no limitations in terms of what she, how she chews. Her medical history is non-contributory. She's healthy. She does have, she's a nurse. She has a, a slight skin sensitivity to chloraxidine. Uh, periodontally immaculate, um, really looks after her teeth well and attends her continuing care on a consistent basis. 
But aesthetics is a huge concern. Uh, poor, as I said, poorly contoured crowns. They don't look natural. She doesn't like that. Very narrow buckle corridors and a gummy smile. And so these are her diagnostic findings. Uh, and so what is she's looking for is, uh, again, to address her V-shaped arch and wanting to have a more consistent smile. So I'm going to just pose a couple of things. When you're looking at this treatment, you know, what disciplines should you consider for optimal results? Okay. Not just restorative, just what, you know, just think in your mind, can she benefit from surgery or implants or perio or ortho or endo or any of those things? And if she can, you know, how do we address that or at least bring that to her awareness? Secondly, if this can be treated restoratively, or if she chooses only a restorative manner, what compromises might we have to explain that she would have to accept? If we just did it completely restorative, is, are, are we going to be able to address all of her concerns, her B-shaped arch, her gummy smile, her hypermobile lip, her bulky crowns? Can we do that all? And if we can't, you know, what compromises are we going to tell her that she has to accept? So let's look at the treatment render. And we look at the aesthetics. Again, I'm just repeating what I've already said. The narrow buccal corridors, the excess overbite and overjet, and the gummy smile. So from the criteria I brought up earlier, tooth position is not ideal. The gingival heights are not ideal, and she's brought that up. And the arrangement of the teeth in the arch are not. So we should be talking about interdisciplinary, an interdisciplinary treatment plan. And again, to Mike's point, I'm not saying that, okay, because I'm bringing up interdisciplinary, that it has to be with a specialist. If you have the skill set and the expertise to be able to perform some of those disciplines, but if you do, but you should be talking about those other disciplines in your treatment plan. And uh, in my instance, I usually involve the specialists because the ones that I work with do a better job than I do. So the goals for treatment, I'm looking at correcting the skeletal and jaw relationships. Why? Because she doesn't like her V-shaped arch. And so we have to be able to do that either orthodontically or orthognathically or a combination. She doesn't like the excess gingival display. So we've got to either talk about surgical osseous crown lengthening with a periodontist, or possibly some orthognathic surgery, or orthodontics, or a combination. How do we widen her smile? Again, another discipline. I can do it restoratively, but it doesn't address the first two. And then we've got to do some restorative and improve the aesthetics of those crowns because they really don't look very aesthetic. So consultations, Mike. I ended up saying, look, at least meet a periodontist and have a discussion about what they can bring to your treatment at least have the consultation, at least meet an orthodontist and an oral maxillofacial surgeon, have the consultation, get the informed consent. If we choose not to, then with each of them say, look, if I don't do orthodontics, what do I, what compromises do I accept? If I don't do orthognathic surgery, what compromises do I have to accept? So that at least get all the information, then whatever we do, we're on the same page. Okay, and then get a diag uh, with the lab, discuss, you know, create a visualized endpoint as well. So she had the consultations. The periodontist also said, listen, I can do osseous crown lengthening, but you really should have an orthodontic consult. That helped reinforce her to say, okay, I will see the orthodontist. So she chose to go ahead and do that after having all the consultations and getting the information. She went in and started having that. The plan was to then do some orthognathic surgery. So what the orthodontist asked me to do is, or actually what they did is section the bridge and they said, listen, would you make individual crowns on those to an idealized contour? And then I can I at least know how to move the roots better. Like, Absolutely. So cut the section, the crowns, removed, uh, remove those crowns. You can see some of the discoloration. It wasn't carries made some mil, um, milled restorations. And then she went through orthodontics as well and set up for orthognathic surgery. So now as she's going through that, she finishes post-ortho, ready to go through orthognathic surgery. Her perio is really, really good. She's looking after her teeth. We finish 
we've left some spaces to be uh, in the teeth and diastomas. The reason is we want to I want to reproportion the teeth to give her more idealized proportion. So we needed to create a little bit of a diastema that was planned ahead of time with the orthodontist and the or, or and the oral surgeon. Now we finish and. She's not fully liking everything. She actually says, listen, I feel my jaw is a little bit crooked. My smile's a little irregular. The lip curves in different ways. So now we're sitting down with the oral surgeon and the orthodontist going, listen, some of these things, we took photographs, we took video before we started to say, hey, your lip dynamics are the same, but certain things are gonna be different. And you have to, cause some of your facial features have changed. So what we ended up doing was the orthodontist said, listen, I'm comfortable doing some aligner treatment as well. If she wants to correct a few things, why don't you finish the treatment? And I said, well, I wasn't comfortable finishing the treatment, but here's what I'll do. I'll prep the teeth and I'll do some long-term provisionals. So I did that. I idealized the proportions. And then she went through close to a year of aligners to get everything the way she was she really was looking for. Once we did that and she was happy with her occlusion and the aesthetics, then it was pretty easy because now I knew I could scan what she liked already and what her occlusion was like and get the lab to reproduce that in final definitive restoration. So I scanned that, ref the lab refined everything, created some details in the restorations and then provided us with, you know, the final restorations in a highly aesthetic uh, condition. And that made her happy. So what did we do with the treatment plan? I mean, we basically addressed her with minimal compromise. However, yes, when you're looking at it, there was a lot of treatment. And Mike, to your point, this treatment took, because she wanted, she was very picky with what she wanted and rightfully so, you know, this ended up taking four years because she went through an extra year of orthodontics because she still wasn't fully happy with some of the things. And so that's what we ended up going through. Did she pay for the provisionals? And they, absolutely. Uh, there was some extra cost. That, and so we told her, look, this is where we're at. If you want to do this, here's an extra cost to do that. And she felt there was value in that. And so she continued on and did that. But it allowed us to do the treatment and optimize the treatment for her. But tooth position, gingival heights, and the arrangement of the teeth, they weren't acceptable. So we did discuss and introduce her to an interdisciplinary approach. And as I said, I chose not to do those disciplines. I know if you did some of the, you might've done some of the surgery because of your expertise and your comfort level. And that's great. Um, I just don't have that comfort level with the surgery. So I chose not to do that. So, and those and are the that's two always cases. A good choice, as you know, I said, the biggest yeah. thing I always tell people is that you have to know your limitations and you, you know, you do become that person after a while that you kind of do everything, but um, right. you're absolutely right. Because there's some, some procedures I can't do and I have to refer it out and I, but you have to recognize that that's the biggest key that you mentioned here. Right. So I'm hoping people appreciate that. Good. Awesome. Um, yeah, and, and as I said, like my main thing is I want you to look at, I would like people to look at things. If, if, if everything's aligned properly, tissue heights, facial aesthetics, the teeth within the arch are all nice. Hey, it's restorative. Do it direct, do it indirect, do a combination case. It really doesn't matter. Um, but the moment they're off, I think there's an obligation for us to at least mention the involvement of another discipline. And then, like I said, Whoever, uh, however you want to approach that discipline, if you want to do it yourself or not, just do it to the standard that uh, is optimal. That's excellent. That's, that's excellent. What else? Yeah. That's, uh, Dr. Press, so, you tell me, let me tell you something. You impress a lot of people, I'm sure, with all your procedures here, you know, because there are a lot of times, like I said, people don't want to go to multiple disciplines or they don't know yep. that they should. And I think by you telling them that they should, is it's a great thing, you know, so that way they know what's going on. And uh, the patient, that's always about the patient. You inform them, they make right. a decision. If they feel uncomfortable because they, something went wrong, everybody has records. <laughs> so that's the important part. Right, no, that's true. Actually, you, you said something really key. They don't know if they should go through it. And that's a good way to put it. I, I, I'll quote you next time I 
I say that, but I think that's a great line because yeah, they don't know what they don't know. And at least if we can tell them why the why, then they can make a decision and say, no, I don't want to do it. And I'm willing to accept this. I'm sure you've had lots of people that go, look, I don't care if my gum is going to be crooked. I just want this done this way. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. But that's just fine. Come back that's to right, me yeah. later. Yeah. 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 So, is there anything else you'd like to add? Anyway, you did great. You're so informed with everything. It's no, wonderful. No, uh, nothing <laughs> at all. I just, uh, I, I really appreciate, I know it was tough for you. You're, Sitting in an airport, I told you I got stuck the same way <laughs> twice uh, Thursday and Friday traveling to lecture, and it's not always the glamorous life, but uh, but we love teaching other people. So exactly. Um, so forgive me if I'm all casual. I don't know if you can see yeah. it, but I'm all casual here. I'm in the middle of the airport, as you can see. So just forgive yeah. me for that. But listen, you did a great job, and you know since this is Thank being you. recorded, please tell Serena I said hello, and I miss you. I miss them all over there. Okay. <laughs> I will. The Rutgers. Okay. All right. Thanks, Fresh. I'm going to sign right. off. Thanks and very then, much. Uh, love you guys. Be safe, okay? All right, world. All right. That's, a, Thank that's you. a famous press from Canada. Right. Take care, guys. Great. Take care. Travel safe. All right. Okay. All right.